we're going to talk this weekend about this quantum life, and I'm calling this Awakening to Quantum Life. That is the title of the conference. Um, the subtitle is The Kingdom of God is Within You. And I'll say to you who are here, and I will say to those that will watch later, that uh, I'm, I'm sharing and focusing in this weekend on the quantum life being the kingdom of God because I'm speaking to you as a group of Christian people. There will be some that watch this video on our website down the road that might not even be Christians. I'm, I, I have a morning group I meet live with every day now, and uh, I will going forward have this group. I'm going to invite people to join. I'll tell you more about it later called Quantum Life with Steve McVeigh. And uh, I've already been asked, well, how bible are you going to be? How religious are you going to be? And, you know, if you have never been religious, there are certain things that seem religious to you, even though they may not seem religious to other people. But there is a world of spirituality out there that does share some of the same language as the religious world. Uh, and so in this group with you guys, I'm going to be sharing some Bible verses and some theological truths that uh, generally in the quantum life group I may not be as explicit about because I'm trying to have a, uh, a broader range of people who are exposed to the message. Awakening to Quantum Life is the name of the conference, and I'm teaching this because of what has happened in my own life as a result of studying quantum mechanics. It's been nothing less than exhilarating for me. My wife will tell you that she has watched me actually wipe tears of joy out of my eyes. Now, if you had told me years ago the day would come that I would shed tears of joy studying science, I would have said, good grief, I must be going to get dementia in my old age or something. What could be emotionally stirring about studying science? The answer is understanding that quantum science is different from the science that most of us grew up with. Quantum science is not physical science. It is metaphysical. Another word for metaphysical is spiritual. And so it's impossible to talk about quantum mechanics without framing it inside the context of spirituality. I believe it was Albert Einstein who said during his lifetime as he began to know more and more about this, all the scientists of the future will be mystics. We've come to a place where there is a change going on in the world like we have not seen in human history. And it is a change that has only begun to take place in the last 100 years. Early in the 20th century, a young group of scientists began to emerge and point out discoveries they had made that turned the science of the last three or four hundred years upside down on its head. And just like in the religious world, so in the science world, there are fundamentalists. There are those who want to cling to the views and practices of the past, and they're absolutely unwilling to change. That's true in the science world and in the world of religion. But the problem is... When you confront truth, it can't be denied if you're honest. And so you've got people like Albert Einstein who initially opposed some of the quantum teachings and discoveries that were being made by his contemporaries. He opposed it. He spoke out against it. And you won't understand this necessarily now, but... When we talk about things like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Einstein is famous for having been said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. But Einstein himself became a reluctant convert and ultimately was a real contributor in the discipline of quantum science. When we talk quantum science, we're talking about a different kind of science than you and I were taught in school, and that doesn't matter how old you are in this group or watching because quantum science is still not being taught in the schools because the ship turns slowly. Scientific materialism is still being taught. But we're standing at a place where we've come to realize through science that what the Bible has told us all along is actually true. There is a hidden world that you cannot see with your eyes. 
There is a world that transcends matter. It transcends material things. It is a world of energy. It is a world that though you cannot see it with your eyes, if you believe the science behind it, you will realize that world, that energy, is the source of everything that you can see with your eyes. And it, that unseen world, is what is ultimately and eternally real. Everything else we see is temporary at best. So if the real meaning, the existential meaning of life is to be found in that invisible world, that unseen world, it would serve us well to know what that world is and how it functions. Now the things that I'm going to talk about today and that I'll write about in the book and I'll talk about in the Quantum Life group I'm going to continue having, the things I'm going to talk about will cause you to bristle at times. It'll cause you to say, that, that can't be true. You might even say, I don't believe that. But if you find yourself resisting some of the things I'm going to say for one reason or another, just know this, you're in good company because no less great people than Albert Einstein struggled with the science of this. And so it requires a complete paradigm shift. In the movie The Matrix, there's a scene that has become an iconic metaphor in contemporary culture about the need for a kind of awakening that leads to an absolute paradigm shift. I mean a whole new way of seeing things. You'll remember the scene if you've seen the movie. It's the scene where Morpheus says to, to Neo, you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how far the rabbit hole goes. Well, I'll tell you that the place of humanity in work, the flow of world history right now has brought us to that point where we have such a decision to make because 21st century uh, technology and even 20th century technology to an extent has uncovered a rabbit hole that even the most sophisticated scientists among us have found to be nothing less than absolutely shocking. Like the matrix, it's an otherworldly dimension where everything we thought we knew is being turned upside down. The problem in the world of religion is people want you to change your radios from AM to FM because they'll tell you you get a stronger and clearer signal. But in reality, what we know that we're being told now is, <laughs> you just need to throw away your radio because you don't have a device right now to receive the truth that you need to understand. And if you try to use the old concrete, finite, mechanistic tools that you've used for understanding throughout your life, you're not going to get this because this is a totally different world where normal rules don't apply. It is the unseen world. It's the kingdom of God. It's the matrix. The matrix is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Who is it?
This... This isn't the Matrix. No. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software still hardwired to their system. That means that anyone we haven't unplugged is potentially an agent. Inside the Matrix, they are everyone and they are no one. We have survived by hiding from them, by running from them. But they are the gatekeepers. They are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys, which means that sooner or later, someone is going to have to fight them. Someone? I won't lie to you, Neil. Every single man or woman who has stood their ground, everyone who has fought an agent has died. But where they have failed, you will succeed. Why? I've seen an agent punch through a concrete wall. Men have emptied entire clips at them and hit nothing but air. Yet their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. Because of that, they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? No, Neo. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. We got trouble. The furthest that Neo's imagination could take him was to a world where he could dodge bullets. But the fact that he was thinking that way showed that he was still living in his head in an old, linear, predictable, mechanistic world. And what Morpheus was saying to him was, there is a world out there that is beyond your comprehension. And in that world, you won't even need to dodge bullets. There's a transcendent matrix above us and around us that encompasses the physical reality that we live in. Now, he talks of the matrix, and I'm going to say the word as he used it in this clip is a lowercase m, matrix, the system in which we live. But there is a system some have called Greg Braden, author Greg Braden is one who does, refer to this as a divine matrix. A divine matrix within which everything else lives and moves and exists. We live in a, a time where recent discoveries have a, are about to catapult us into a, an understanding of this reality, this divine matrix that's going to change our individual lives beyond anything we have been able to imagine, and it's going to actually alter our collective experience of what it means to be human. And as you're going to see in this conference and in the days to come, this rabbit hole is deep. It is very deep. And we've reached a fork in the road where we're going to have to decide how we're going to live our lives. We can take the pill, the blue pill, and we can hold on to our lifelong linear religious beliefs about God and our old scientific materialist views of the world around us. Or we can take the red pill and move into a place where we say, I never even knew this world existed. To put it very simply, here it is. You don't know what you don't know right? We don't know what we don't know until we've been exposed to it. And in this new world, this divine matrix, this kingdom of God, Jesus called it, we're going to breach the bounds of a closed-ended universe, a universe that's restrictive, a universe that is illusory. It is an illusion. I'll tell you about this physical world that you see with your eyes. It's really an illusion. If you were to take an electron microscope and zoom in on any object, let's take this object in my hand, the remote. You put this under an electron microscope and you zoom in and it begins to magnify the size of the, of the, 
of the uh, remote. And then you keep zooming in, and now you get down to where you see the paint, and you zoom in further, and you get down to the, to the, to the level where you see the molecules in this. And you keep zooming in, and now you see the atom. And in the atom, you know, you've got the proton and the neutron and the electron. You keep zooming in, and now you get to the subatomic particles, and you see quarks and other subatomic material. When you've zoomed in closely enough, you reach the place where you magnify and zoom in far enough, and you will finally reach a place where you see, and this has been proven over and over and over and over again in labs, you see those subatomic particles are not actually substance, they're energy. Everything is energy. And you would see that this remote I hold in my hand is really just energy manifesting as a solid object. And when you zoom into that subatomic level and you see that subatomic material that is energy, you know what happens with it? It begins to pop in and out of appearance. I want to say existence, but that would be a, a wrong way to describe it because energy doesn't cease to exist. It just can transform into different forms. For instance, you can have water, steam, or ice. Energy doesn't disappear. Energy is eternal. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. I'll tell you later that this energy is sourced in a person who has no beginning and end. But if you zoom in and look at the subatomic level, it would begin to literally pop in and out of existence, so to speak. You, now you see it, now you don't. Now here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. You and I, living in physical bodies, are that very thing. Are we physical? Well, I would say this. We are spirit. We are energy manifesting in physical form. But just like I told you at the subatomic level, that that energy pops in and out of visibility, you are made of material, physical material, your body is, but did you know that at the subatomic level you're doing the same thing? In fact, you're popping in and out of, I'm going to use the word existence, but you know I don't really mean that. You're popping in and out of existence, scientists know it now, to the tune of 20,000 times a nanosecond. Now, I can't see that when I look at you or you when you look at me. James works in the film industry. How many frames does it take for it to, there to appear to be motion on a film? Huh? When if you're watching a film, it takes 24 still shots moving for there to, you know, 24 frames, and you have the illusion of motion as you watch the film. That's 24. I just told you you're popping in and out 20,000 times a nanosecond. So you can see why it doesn't appear to you that you're popping in and out of existence or popping in and out of this world, if you will, but you are. Now, here's the question. <laughs> well, here, let me make the statement, then I'll ask the question. If you're popping in and out 20,000 times every billionth of a second, you're only, you're only here part-time. <laughs> now, the question I ask you to think about is, well, where are you the rest of the time? I'll tell you where you're seated in an unseen domain. You follow? You're actually in two places at one time. This is exactly what quantum science teaches us. Quantum entanglement is the word for it. Being in two places at one time. What does it mean to live in that unseen world while we manifest in this world? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And you're going to see that when we understand how that world functions, it changes everything because like Neo, we have to throw away our linear thinking. We have to throw away our temporal understanding, and we have to rise above it and, and realize that we live in a transcendent place within which everything else lives and moves and exists. And when we understand that culture, that matrix, that kingdom of God, as Jesus called it, and we know how it works, then and only then will we finally be able to begin to live the life that we're capable of living. Christ, the spirit of Christ, 
is eternal. True? But now listen to the next question because it's a tricky question you might want to think about before you answer. Eternal means not of the temporal world. Eternal is not a word that specifically speaks to duration of time or origin of time. We use it that way. But strictly speaking, eternal stands in contradiction to temporal. But now I'm going to make an application using the word eternal in the time-space dimension where we live. Does eternal have an ending to it? No. Does eternal have a beginning to it? No. It stands outside of time. Did Christ, does Christ have a beginning or an end? No. But now listen to the next question. Did Jesus have a beginning? Yes. Christ has forever lived. But when Christ manifested through the incarnation in human form, to quote the book of Hebrews, God prepared him a body. That's in the book of Hebrews. There was no 170-pound Jewish carpenter in heaven before the incarnation. The body of Jesus was formed and joined together with, in union with the Spirit of Christ. So Jesus is the Christ. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying the physical body of Jesus came into this world through Mary and Christ took residence in that physical body. Jesus was a man. Do you know when I make that statement, it may even affect some of you in this room that way. It makes some people bristle, and they feel very urgent need to say, yeah, but he's also God. I didn't say he wasn't or isn't. But the problem we have in the modern world today, especially in the church world, is people are quick to affirm the deity of Jesus Christ, but they're not so fast to identify his humanity. Jesus was a man. The man Jesus, the man Jesus. There was no physical man Jesus before the incarnation. There was Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and there was Christ. But the man Jesus, he, just like you and me, his body began to grow in his mother's womb and began to mature until finally a baby was born. And this Jesus understood quantum life. And he lived in it. He lived in it completely. This Jesus, who by the way, never, he, don't misunderstand me, you watching the video and you in here, I'm not saying Jesus is not the Son of God. Of course he is. But I am going to tell you this. He never called himself that. He always called himself what? The son of man. I, do you suppose that Christ knew the day would come that we would have a hard time accepting the humanity of Jesus? Gnostics did. and People still do today. I mean, at the risk of sounding crass, Jesus sat on the toilet. Jesus had to wash his feet. Jesus had bad breath. He was a man. But Jesus knew what it is to live and operate inside the quantum world, the kingdom of God. He understood the quantum laws, which are universal laws, absolute laws that apply in every place at every time in every situation. He understood it, and I'm here to tell you, Jesus is for us a mirror image of what we have been created to be. His lifestyle confounded people who lived with him because they lacked the eyes to see the divine matrix. They didn't understand the greater reality around them. In fact, I'll say the greater reality that was in them. 
They were like Neo trying to understand Morpheus when Morpheus was talking at a level Neo couldn't begin to grasp. And you see it again and again and again in the scripture. The disciples struggling through their limited human logic to try to understand the life Jesus lived and how he was doing that. He was living a transcendent life, a quantum life, and they were trying to understand it through temporal understanding logic. They were trying to measure the infinite with finite tools. They were trying to figure out how to change the stations on the radio, not knowing they just needed to throw away the radio because they didn't need to understand how to dodge bullets. Jesus lived a different kind of life. It was a life that was continuously animated by divine energy. His Father, the Creator. He didn't live independently. He lived a transcendent life. He didn't live out of ego, self. In fact, he said things like, the teachings that I do, they're not mine. That's John 7, 16. The words that you hear me speak, they're not mine. That's John 14, 24. I haven't even come here on my own, John 8, 42. I do nothing on my own initiative, John 5, 30. Jesus said it again and again and again. The life I'm living is because I'm relying upon a greater power, an unseen energy, a life source that you cannot measure using human instruments. What would happen if we began to understand this world the way Jesus did? What would happen to us? How would it change our lives? But, sadly, people are not always ready to move to a new level. Their limiting beliefs are held in place by their religious orientation or their educational backgrounds. Again, I say scientific materialists are every bit as fun fundamentalist and narrow-minded as a lot of religious people are. They're not willing to change. Henry David Thoreau, I remember the first time I read his book, Walden Pond, and the impact it made on me. He said a lot of good stuff. I don't like everything he said, but this is a good quote. Thoreau said, a man receives only what he's able to, or ready to receive, whether physically or intellectually or morally. As animals conceive their kinds at certain seasons only, we hear and apprehend only what we already half know. If there is something which does not concern me, which is out of my line, which by experience or by genius my attention is not drawn to, however novel and remarkable it may be, if it is spoken, I hear it not. If it is written, I read it not. Or if, if I read it, it does not detain me. Every man thus tracks himself through life, and all is hearing and reading, and with the rest which he has observed. Wait a minute. With all his hearing and reading and observation and traveling, his observations make a chain. The phenomena or fact that cannot in any wise be linked. You get what he's saying? <laughs> Some people just aren't ready. And I tell you, if you grew up in the evangelical church world, in the conservative environment of the evangelical church, or if you grew up in, in scientific materialism, which we all did, we have to be ready. We've known for 2,000 years what Jesus did. Now listen carefully, and I'll try to be clear. We've known for 2,000 years what Jesus did, what he did, but now... We're at a place where we can begin to understand how he did it. How he did it. For instance, when he appeared behind a closed 
and locked door in the upper room when they, everything was shut up tight. That's called quantum tunneling. When he suddenly appeared out of nowhere before his disciples, that's called quantum teleportation. When he spoke to the tree and cursed it and it withered, that is called directed intentional quantum vibration. When he said, I and my father are one, that's called quantum entanglement. Now hear what I'm saying. I want to be clear. I'll try to be clear about this. The things that Jesus did, we certainly would say were miraculous, but they weren't magic. What is a miracle? A miracle is something that causes wonder and awe. But St. Augustine, I think though the man said a lot of bad stuff, he also said a lot of good stuff, and he was right on the mark with this. Augustine said that miracles are not a violation of the laws of nature, but only a violation of what we presently understand about nature. I mean, think about it, 150 years ago, a lot of you flew to this conference 150 years ago. If your grandparents up line had seen you get on that airplane and it taxi down the runway and take off and go 35,000 feet in the air and bring you here in the amount of time it took to get you here, you know what they would have called that? A miracle. And you know what? They would have been right. True? I mean, it's not a violation of the laws of nature. They wouldn't have understood the laws of aerodynamics, or they certainly wouldn't have understood the Bernoulli principle and how that airplane is not pushed but lifted off the ground. They wouldn't have understood that. They would have said it's miraculous. Well, you know what? As much as I have flown and fly in this world, I still sometimes will get on one of those big old 77, 777s, and when that thing leaves and takes off, I still sometimes I'm just marvel that this many people sitting in something this heavy can do this. Recently, I took, brought my grandson Gabriel back from Atlanta to see us here, and it's his first time to get on an airplane, and I videoed him because I wanted to see it. And I've got it on video of where when the plane lifted off, he said, oh, Wow! We're flying! a miracle to him. Jesus did miracles, but those miracles are not a violation of the laws that God has put into this universe. He simply understood some things we didn't understand. Jesus lived a life that was supernatural, right? Now, let me be sure to remind you that when we say supernatural, and we say, well, he was supernatural. Let me make sure you understand that doesn't mean it wasn't a natural life that he lived. If I talk about a car being fast, I say that car is fast. But this car over here, this car is super fast. Do I mean the super fast car is not fast? No. I mean the super fast car is like fast on steroids, you know what I mean? It's really fast. So to say that Jesus, the Son of Man, was supernatural and lived supernaturally doesn't mean that he didn't live a natural life. It, meant, it means that he lived a supernatural life. He lived a life that you and I were created to live. Do you believe that? hope you do because I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. As I said earlier, he is the mirror image of who you are but just may not know yet. You may not know it. He's the mirror image of our original identity, an identity that we have never lost as a species. Humankind has never lost our identity. We only lost sight of it. But when Jesus lived this natural life, no, this supernatural, super fast, supernatural life, his disciples were they were still linear. They were still thinking we need to learn how to dodge bullets. And Jesus was trying to say, 
When you understand this, you'll know you don't have to dodge bullets. There's another dimension you've not understood yet. But the things Jesus did, they didn't know how he did it. They watched the things that he did, and they were baffled by it. But Jesus told them plainly. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm sourced in a quantum world. My kingdom is not of this world, but the mouth was talking, but the ears and the ears were working, but the mind wasn't perceiving when Jesus would tell them that because they were still trying to make sense out of it using linear mechanistic paradigms. They marveled at the things Jesus did. And Jesus said to them, well, but guys, just chill out. I mean, I can do that because I'm Jesus. Is that, why, is that what he said? He said, well, you can't do this, but I can because I'm Jesus. You're not. No, that's not what he said at all. In fact, in John 14, he said, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to my Father. It's like they said, how do you do that? You, you, you appear out of nowhere. You walk on water. You talk to trees, and they die. You're over there, then suddenly you're over here. You're multiplying bread and fish. You're turning water into wine. What is up with you? How do you do that stuff? And Jesus said, because I'm not operating out of this linear, closed, mechanistic world that you're operating out of. I understand source. I'm tapped in to the quantum world, the kingdom of God. It's not me doing it like you're thinking. You've got to do it. You don't understand. It's this divine energy in me, and it is me, but it's the divine energy in me. It's divine life in me. I said, boy, we wish we could do that. He says, you'll do more than this once you understand. You can do even bigger and better, greater things than I'm doing. But how do you do it? And I can almost... Visualize it like Jesus saying, I have so much I want to tell you, but you're not able to bear it now. Do you remember that Bible verse? How do you do this? How's this work? One day you'll be doing more than this. How? Uh, I want to tell you, but you, you just aren't able to handle it right now. But I am going back to the Father. And the reason this is a big thing is because when I go back, I'm going to send a teacher. And that teacher is going to come and guide you into the truth. You get where I'm going with this? That teacher is going to guide you into the truth. Well, I've got good news for you. The teacher has come. And we've for the first time in human history, have reached a place where we are being led into this truth. Now, here's the difficult part. It is the medium through which we're being taught this truth. I'll give you an example of what I mean before I make my point explicitly. When Jesus began to come forward publicly and talk about establishing the kingdom of God, in this world, when he talked about the kingdom of God in this world, the disciples and those even that didn't follow him were using a different paradigm for interpreting his words. Both his disciples, his friends and enemies thought that he was going to set up a physical kingdom and he was going to sit on the throne and the Caesar would step down and he would take over. And the, even his closest friends believed it, and they even among themselves argued, said, I get to sit on his right hand. Uh-uh, I do. No, I do. Jesus, who gets to sit on your right hand? And I'm sure it didn't happen like this, but internally it might have been. <laughs> you don't get it, boys. My kingdom is not of this world. Well, when are you going to start your kingdom? When are you going to start your kingdom? Do you remember what he answered them when they said that? The kingdom of God is already among you. There's nothing for me to establish, to start. I can establish in the sense of 
helping you understand it. But there's nothing to start. It's already started. It's among you. It's in you. But when I go back to the Father, the teacher's going to come, and she's going to show you. But what you're looking for, you're looking at it in the wrong way. Now, they were looking for a military leader of might and power to take over. There were, and so when Jesus came as a carpenter's son with no illustrious pedigree, they said, no, 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 no. And who were the biggest people that opposed him? What, what demographic of people opposed him most? The religious people because he didn't fit their mold. He wasn't religious enough for them. In fact, they called him a heretic and a blasphemer and all of these things. So now here we are two millennia later, and the teacher is guiding us into this truth of how to live this supernatural life, how to live in this kingdom of God culture, this quantum world, but people sometimes have a problem with it because the medium through which the teacher is teaching us Brace yourself, put a tongue depressor in your mouth. It's not the church. It's the world of science. Remember when they were talking one time to Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious folks, and he was answering back, and they said, well, who, do, who the hell do you think you are? You're a bastard. And one translation of the Bible says that. At least we're not bastards. We're sons of Abraham. They went after him like, who are you to tell us? We're the ones with the doctorate degrees. We're the ones with the high positions. We're the ones of respect, notoriety. Who do you think you are? We don't get, we don't get spiritual truth from you. People get it from us. <laughs> Sounds a lot like the evangelical church to me. I don't need science to tell me what my Bible already tells me. Well, maybe science would help you understand what your Bible has told you. And so the thing that is an affront to the religious pride of the 21st century is that the teacher is not using the platform of the pulpit to teach us this quantum world, this kingdom of God, but rather using the platform of science to teach us this culture. And just like then, religious people have a hard time accepting that. They have a very hard time understanding it. We're living at a time where these greater things are being explained. Now, I was talking to one friend who said to me, Steve, so you're saying the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of the Bible, there's a scientific explanation for? I said, yes. And he said, listen to this. He said to me, well, that, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I said, why? He said, that takes the miraculous out of it. And I said, no, it does not. I said, to the contrary, rather than diminish and reduce the miraculous, it shows us that the whole world is filled with a miraculous atmosphere. It tells us everything is miraculous if we have eyes to see it and if we learn how to function in this world. Today we're living in a time where these greater things are being explained to us, and guess what? The world's waiting to see it. They don't even know what they're waiting for. The Apostle Paul said it in Romans chapter 8, verse 19, that when he said the whole world is waiting in eager, eager anticipation for the manifestation of the children of God to be revealed. The world is waiting for you and I to understand this. The world is waiting for these quantum realities to become real, and it's going to change our world. Jesus said 2,000 years ago, let the one that has an ear to hear listen. We do well to listen because I'm telling you, it's already happening. We're privileged to live. This didn't begin to happen until the early 1900s, 1903, 1910, right around in that time period is when some of these pioneers of quantum mechanics came forward, people like Max Planck, who's the father of quantum physics. He's the one that the Matrix movies were inspired by. People like Niels Bohr, Edwin Schrodinger, uh, uh, all, all these early scientists that they emerged. This was in the early 20th century. Uh, I, I we're just seeing it. It's, it's, it's already started. I think it's true the way C.S. Lewis said it. I think we're seeing it. He said, God is not merely mending 
not simply restoring a status quo, redeemed humanity is to be something more glorious than unfallen humanity. We're about to take a quantum leap, my friends. Things are getting big, exciting. To say it's about time would literally be a factual statement. The fullness of time has come. It's about time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is literally the time for it to take place. If you were in a previous uh, summit meeting with us, you heard me talk about Phyllis Tickle and her book, The Great Emergence, but I mention it again now briefly because it fits so perfectly with what I want to point I want to make. If, by the way, throughout this conference, any books that I put up on the screen would be a book I'd recommend you might enjoy reading. Phyllis Tickle, she was a religious sociologist. She is the one, in fact, who founded the religion department of Publishers Weekly. Brilliant lady. Kentucky sociologist slash theologian who drank Jack Daniels and could talk theology with the best of them. She was a religion professor. In her book, The Great Emergence, she used the analogy of what she called a 500-year rummage sale to describe the religious changes that are happening and have happened over the years in the world. She said that historically, the religion, world of religion cleans house every 500 years and has what she called a giant rummage sale. And in that rummage sale, they decide what to get rid of and what to hold on to. She makes her point by looking back over the last 2,000 years and showing us those benchmarks every 500 years. She started with the incarnation of Christ, which she called the great transformation. It was when a man named Jesus, who was Emmanuel, God with us, gave humanity a new understanding of our relationship to God. And then 500 years later, ah, wrong one. This one, 500, there we go, stop. 500 years later was Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great came along at a time when there was a cataclysmic shift in the world of the Christian church, and it revolved around the debate about the human and divine nature of Jesus and also about the nature of Mary and the status that Mary was to hold in the church. Then the next was the great schism 500 years later at the beginning of a new millennium, 1054. It was the time when the Christian church split into the eastern and western branches that we still see existing today through Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholicism. The big argument a thousand years ago that went on in the church world, big. I mean, this was big. They split and went their separate ways over what kind of bread to use in communion. That was one of the issues, what kind of communion bread to use. And the other was what was called the Philike controversy. That was a controversy about whether the Holy Spirit comes from the Father only or from the Father and the Son. And there's two versions of the Nicene Creed. If you've been to a liturgical church, and we attended the liturgical church, I went the last year I attended traditional church, I was in a liturgical church where we recited the Nicene Creed every week. And the question is, does the Spirit emanate from the Father or from the Father and of the Son? Is the Spirit of the Father or of the Father and of the Son? This church split a thousand years ago over that. And so you have the Eastern Church and the Western Church. And then 500 years ago, in 1517, there was a man named Martin Luther, a priest, German priest, who really upset the apple cart when he get, began to come out against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And on October 31st, 1517, he marched himself right up to the front door of the church in Wittenberg and nailed his 95 theses on the door of that church. And that Martin Luther was single-handedly the cause of the Reformation, but he's known as the iconic leader of it. And through the Great Reformation, once again, the church divided. So then you have Roman Catholicism and you have Protestantism. Every 500 years. Now, remember when I said the 
Martin Luther nailed those theses on the church, October 31, 1517. Here we are 500 years later, and we're at the place that Phyllis Tickle called the Great Emergence. So if you look at the last 2,000 years, something that's been world-changing has happened every 500 years. And by the way, when we talk about the Reformation, don't think of the Reformation as just a religious thing. The Reformation changed everything in culture, not just religion. But here we are 500 years later, and I believe that what's happening here 500 years later is going to be an, yet another concentric circle that's even wider. Remember we talked about before the, I began recording that, you've, that the circle of grace, the circle of eternal truth gets wider and wider and wider and wider. And here we are now 2,000 years after the incarnation, 500 years after the Protestant Reformation, and I believe that what we're seeing is the emergence of the kingdom of God, the quantum age. And this is going to change things like nothing you've ever imagined. Nicholas uh, Tesla, for whom the Tesla car is named, said, this, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it'll make more progress in one decade than all the previous centuries of its existence. We're there. Don't you ever watch, look around in the world and say to yourself, some of you that are my age, do you ever look around in the world and say, holy smoke, I'm living in a Star Trek day and time. Don't we do that? And if I may say it this way, you ain't seen nothing yet. You've just seen the tip of the iceberg. One of the ancient prophets, Daniel, said, that God told him, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the end of time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This thing about knowledge being increased in our day is mind-boggling. Look at this chart. This is human progress. We are at that place in history right now. A shift in human consciousness is occurring as we finally are now recognizing that the material world is not the ground of being that we have thought it was. Our reality, our old understanding of reality is being dismantled and modern evidence has now given us a new understanding. This is exciting stuff to me. The future is here. <laughs> I remember when I was in elementary school, we had a scientist come to our school and he stood up in an assembly in school when I was in the sixth grade. And he said, boys and girls, one day you're going to have one, more than one television at your house. <laughs> and they'll be in color. <laughs> and not only in your house, he said, but one day TVs will be so small that you can carry them around in your hand, in one hand. And we all said, wow. <laughs> it was a marvel to hear that kind of talk. Well, I'm going to tell you, one day, and it won't be long, you're going to see things that you can't imagine because we're coming into the fullness of understanding this quantum life, this kingdom experience, and what kingdom culture is that Jesus understood all along, and we're going to see and do these things and greater than these because of this understanding. I think that a hundred years from now, your great, great, great grandchildren are going to look back at you and me and think we were cavemen. American inventor, futurist named Buckminster Fuller, he created what he called the knowledge doubling curve. And he noted that until 1900, human knowledge had doubled about every 100 years, every century. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today it's not so easy to chart it because different kinds of knowledge have different growth rates. But on general, on average, they say that human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. According to IBM, with the growing development of what IBM calls the Internet of Things, they say 
soon the knowledge of the world will double every 12 hours. Until 1900, knowledge was doubling every 100 years. And now they're saying with the Internet, knowledge will double every 12 hours. You know Google. The CEO of Google, his name is Eric Schmidt, gave a speech, and he said, every two days we create as much information as we did from the dawn of creation all the way up to 2003. You see why the little guy here is standing where he's standing? You see, we tend to think that there is this constant uh, incline of, grow, of, of knowledge, growing knowledge, but that's not how it works. Did you ever do the fruit fly experiment in school where you put two fruit flies in a jar and then there were four and then there were eight and then there were 16 and they reach a point where the exponential growth just becomes so staggering that all the fruit flies die. We, some people are saying they hope that won't happen with humanity and the knowledge we have, especially with the, the potential of damage with destruction through artificial intelligence and some of those things. But my point I'm making is the kind of exponential growth that can be seen is staggering. We're on the edge of something big. I think what I'm going to do, because you had coffee, is we're going to take just a short break, and then we'll have a short run leading right up to the lunch hour. We have simply lacked the perception to, to know it and to, to understand how to live in it. In the last 100 years, we're finally gaining a perception that this quantum world exists. Finally, it begins to make sense to Christians when we hear and look at the words of Jesus who said, don't say the kingdom of God is going to be here or there or at this time or that time. This kingdom of God is among you. It's in you. If you have eyes to see, you will see. There is no distance. There is no delay. It's simply a matter of growing awareness of what always has been. It is finished. It is done. There is an unseen world that exists that's beyond what you can imagine. And in time, you'll come to see it. And now we are. We finally are. And the amazing thing is, we're beginning to know how much we don't know. We know now that in the universe, this universe, there are countless, countless planets. But when I went to school, I was taught there were nine planets. Remember that? We had to memorize them. I could name nine planets. And we were told when I was a boy in school, there are only nine planets. And then they took away Pluto, and now that left us only eight, <laughs> if we hadn't come to know better. <laughs> and now we know how foolish that was. We're coming to understand how much we don't know. There is a world that can't be seen with the eyes. Did you know that even with the instruments the advanced instruments, instruments we have today that can gaze out across the cosmos, you only see 4% of what's there. 96% of it is dark matter or dark energy. You, don't, you only see 4%. And of the 4% we can see, what percentage of that which we can see do we really even understand? So we're finally getting to the place where technology is humbling us and causing us to say, maybe we don't know everything. Sooner or later, the ba even the Baptists will have to acknowledge that. <laughs> but we're saying, yes, there's a lot we don't know. There's a world out there that you can't taste, you can't touch, you can't smell, you can't hear, 
you can't see. It's a hidden world, but it's more real than anything we can see. Niels Bohr, one of the early fathers of quantum mechanics, remember what I talked about, how that everything pops in and out of visibility or 20,000 times a nanosecond? Here's the way Niels Bohr said it, and he was, he's a legend in the quantum world. He said, everything we call real is made of things that cannot actually be regarded as real. If quantum mechanics has it profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going to share information with you during this conference. At some point, I suspect almost every one of you in here is going to say to yourself, yeah, I don't believe that. And according to Niels Bohr, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, if you don't say that at some point, you haven't heard it clearly. Because this is so miraculous. This is so transcendent. This is so otherworldly that it seems impossible to believe, especially when I talk to you tonight about the double slit experiment. You'll, that'll rock your world. It's called the experiment that broke reality. If... This transcendent world is what's ultimately real, and this temporal world is just that. There's a world that supersedes this space-time dimension, and it both contains, it created, and now contains and controls this world that we see. We've thought that we understood, but we've come to our beliefs about what reality is through the world of science, materialistic science, that we've grown up on, and now we realize that some of the science that we were taught in many ways was limited at best and absolutely wrong at worst. In fact, the scientific materialism that we grew up with has led us astray in a lot of ways. Again, I'm not saying it wasn't right about some things, but it was wrong about a lot of things. Here's the thing that surprises some people, especially the pseudo-intellectuals, and I have no problem with intellectualism, but I'm talking pseudo-intellects. They think they're intellectual, who says, I'm all about science, and they act as if science is the anchor of everything that you can know, but what many people don't realize is that the word scientist or science did not even exist 400 years ago. Did you just hear what I just said? The word science, scientist, did not exist. There was no such word. I mean, there was a Latin word that was similar, but it simply meant knowledge. But science as an academic discipline was unknown. The word was first actually coined by a man named William Hewell, who was actually an Anglican priest. But he was also into study but of science, of nature, of these things we're talking about. But what we would call scientists today, but before, a little less than 400 years ago, they called them one of two things. They either called them natural philosophers or they called them theologians. Because remember, true science is a study of the way God works. So what we call science today, it used to be a part of philosophy and theology. Science as a discipline is relatively new. But, you know, three or four hundred years is long enough for people to have grown up in it. And people that are all about scientific materialism, well, this is the ultimate truth, scientific materialism. They remind me of the folks I've met in churches that say, well, if, if, if the King James Bible was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> It's the same kind of argument. Isaac Newton is one of the real uh, strong voices that brought us to an understanding of scientific materialism. Let me, let me make a distinction between what I mean when I mention scientific materialism and the quantum world. Scientific materialism is this. It is the belief that there is this space in which everything exists. And inside this space are objects that stand or hang or suspended in space. And every object is an independent entity unto itself. And between the different objects is empty space. 
So there is a, 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 a field, a world filled with empty space, a universe, and there are objects in it. There are planets, there are people, there are animals, there are remote controls and tables and chairs and trees and sandwiches. <laughs> but everything is independent of everything else. Scientific materialism says the reason these things exist is because of what is called upward causation. That is, you have atoms which give rise to molecules, which gives rise to cells, which gives rise to objects. It's a bottom-up existence of reality. Everything separated. Bottom-up. And in that world, it's a mechanistic world. You can predict what's going to happen because ultimately in scientific materialism, the world is like a big machine. Isaac Newton reputedly had the apple fall on his head while he sat under the tree. He said, why did that apple fall? And he began to study and come to his conclusions about gravity. And he began to say, there is a mechanistic linear way that things work. So you can know that if A is true and B is true and C is true, you can predict D is going to happen. It's linear. It's predictable. It's mechanistic as in mechanical. So if we can understand how the physical world works, we can predict things. And he was largely right about what's called the macroscopic, macroscopic world, the larger world. We still rely on some of the things we got through scientific materialism and people like Isaac Newton. We know when we go to bed in the dark tonight that tomorrow morning the sun is going to come up because the earth will revolve around the sun. We know that, that, that there will be winter and then spring and then summer and then fall. We can predict the seasons. There's a linear progression to it. So now understand, I'm not saying that there is not a linear mechanistic element to the world we live in. There is, indeed there is, in the macroscopic world. But then the quantum physicists begin to explore using the instruments available to us today. And they begin to say, wait a minute. There is a world that you can't see with your eyes. It's so different from this world that we do see with our eyes that it follows none of the ordinary rules. It doesn't follow the rules of this visible world. First of all, they say, we come, have come to understand that the reality in this planet even that you live on and the universe at large does not consist of individual objects hanging or suspended in empty space. But in fact, there is no such thing as empty space. There is no empty space. That 96% that you cannot see is energy. And you and everything that you can see is a physical expression of that energy but even the 96% that you cannot see is there and it's energy. Astronomers have watched it for a long time. They'll, they'll, they'll say, we cannot see dark energy or dark matter, but we know it's there because we see the way that things react to it that we can measure and view. Think of it like this. Imagine my hand is invisible and you're watching this uh, remote move through the air and if the remote does, if the remote does this, You'll say, well, it went around something, even if you couldn't see my hand. So they say, we know now that there is no such thing as empty space. Here's the definitive statement to remember. Everything is connected. Now let he who has ears listen, because I'm going to talk science and see if you can translate faith. Everything is connected. There is this field. There is this world, quantum world, there is this kingdom, there is this dimension within which everything else exists 
and consist. It's held together by that. There's no empty space. But by virtue of the union that all things have to that field, that energy, all pervasive, all encompassing energy, that connects us all to each other. I'm going to give a little question to my morning group. Watch how smart they are. <laughs> Watch them. I'm going to ask them to answer. I'm going to, I'm going to ask them to answer out loud in unison. I'm going to ask you in my morning group. Now, don't embarrass me. and I, Don't embarrass me in front of my friends. I'm going to ask you to answer out loud. I'm looking for a one-word answer. What is the number one lesson that quantum physics teaches us? Union. <laughs> Union. Union. Everything is joined together. There is no empty space. Everything is interconnected by virtue of the connection and the union that we share with the matrix, with the divine energy, with the creator, with what some have called source, some have called universe. See, here's the thing about religious people. They get antsy when you use words that aren't religious, even if the words mean the same thing. Even if the words mean the same thing, they get antsy if you don't use their words. But the difference, a big difference in quantum science and Scientific materialism is that quantum science says, no, you guys are wrong. There aren't a multitude of independent objects all standing separated from each other. Everything comes together and exists in union by virtue of the fact that we've all been taken in and, are, and have always lived inside of this divine field of energy, which some are calling love. Even some scientists. Some of you have heard me say it, I know, but remember, we've got newbies that haven't heard this. Albert Einstein identified what he believed and stated was the most important question a person could ask and answer. The most important question, Einstein said, anybody can ever ask and needs to answer is, is the universe a friendly place? And Einstein would come to conclude, yes, the universe is a friendly place. Now, if you want to talk church talk, somebody might have asked it this way. Is God really good? Is our creator really good? And science says, yes. So there is this Newtonian world that's all about physical matter and the cosmos is a machine with cogs and gears but then there is this invisible world that is all about energy where there is no separateness Newton described a material world where individual particles of matter followed certain laws of motion through space and time it is a linear model that has affected our thinking in every area of life and I'll prove it those of you who grew up in church were told if you pray if you read your Bible, if you go to church, if you help the poor, if you do this, 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 and this, there are the linear steps, and the outcome will be that. God will bless you or whatever. Do you see this Newtonian mindset, this linear mindset has even affected us right down to the core of our religious views. Quantum science says no. No, we all exist in this field, and we're all one. It's been hidden. It is a world of subatomic energy that we're now finally beginning to be able to understand. It wasn't until the 19th century that the man who proposed electromagnetic therapy, theory, his name was James Clerk Maxwell, he formally offered a scientific description of this field that I'm talking about. He described it as, and I quote, a material substance of a more subtle kind of visible body supposed to exist in those parts of space which are apparently empty. Listen to this quote from Albert Einstein, 1928. 
according to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. And I'll explain ether in a minute. For in such space, there not only would be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for the standards of space. All right, let me, get, let me say it this way. You can call it the, ma the divine matrix. You can call it the field. You can call it, oh, the word ether. Sixth century B.C., Greeks called it the ether. The ether. They, they described the ether as the air that the gods breathe. You can call it source, universe. Jesus called it the kingdom of God. Paul called it in Christ. He said to the Athenians on Mars Hill, In him we live and move and exist. The Bible tells us in Ephesians there is one spirit who is over all and through all and in all. The world we live in, the universe, everything that exists, everything is one body united by spirit. And by the way, the word spirit is a word that uh, is often used as well. So it is then an invisible world, an atmosphere of, of energy, of divine love in which we live. Let's see if I get to the... Watch this.
you, you really want to be arrogant about what you believe? <laughs> Did you see where you fit in that? <laughs> Maybe I don't know everything. There's a lot out there. And the interesting thing is, is that scientists, what you just saw, scientists used to believe that more than 90% of the cosmos is missing. It appears to be empty space. They've said of what exists out there, if, if, if all that were in fact empty space, scientists said what exists out there, only 10% would have anything in it. But now wait a minute, wait a minute. The scientific materialists then would say, but wait, an atom consists of a proton, a neutron, and an electron, and the rest of it is empty. It's got the proton, neutron, electron revolving around the nucleus, and the rest of that atom is empty. If the universe were as empty as scientific uh, materialists used to tell us, if you had taken away all of what they believe to be empty space in the universe, the universe would have been the size of a green pea. Like a green English pea. The whole universe would have been that size if you'd taken away all the empty space and compressed it if they were, had been right. That's a lot of empty space. <laughs> but in the 20th century... Modern science discovered what's inside that empty space, and as I keep saying, it's a field of energy that's different from every other kind of energy. It's everywhere. It's always existed. It, it con controls and contains it all. Max Planck says that the existence, remember, learn the name Max Planck. That's the starting place for quantum physics. Not everybody that writes or speaks about quantum physicists, physics are physicists. By the way, Newell or Hewell, who coined the word science, he also is the one that coined the word physics. But uh, Max Planck, you need to learn his name. He's the inspiration for the Matrix movies, P-L-A-N-C-K, and he was the father of quantum physics. He said that the existence of this field, this ether, this matrix, this source, this universe, this kingdom of God, this in Christ place, he says that this field suggests an intelligence, that intelligence is responsible for our physical world. He said, quote, we must assume behind this force that we see as matter the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. You know, when we grew up, scientists gloated over their atheistic posture, right? Science, we thought, oh, they're a bunch of atheists. Not anymore. Not anymore. Scientists now are far from being atheists. In fact, one of my favorite quantum physicists, he's a re retired professor of uh, theoretical physics at uh, University of Oregon, Amit Goswami. He's, his dad was a Hindu guru. I've taken some courses with him. I suspect he's Hindu, though he doesn't explic explicitly say it, but I suspect he's followed in daddy's footsteps. His dad was a Hindu guru, but Amit Goswami wrote a book for the scientific community, and I'd encourage, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up later, you'll see the book later, I'll put a slide up with a quote from it, he wrote a book for the scientific community, and the book is called, God is Not Dead. Now, I'll be quick to say that when uh, somebody like Goswami, or even going all the way back to Einstein and some of those folks, when they say the word God, they're not, they don't mean the same thing you and I mean. But I'll say more about that. But Goswami wrote a book called God is Not Dead, and he proves in his book, and it's, you could read it. It's not, it's not such heady stuff that the average person like you and me could not read it. He proves in his book the folly of this concept of upward causation classic hierarchy, upward causation, atoms, molecules, cells, organs, beings. He proves the folly of that, and he proves conclusively, I think indisputably, he proves what he calls downward causation, that there is a transcendent life above. Now, you and I take that for granted, right? But the scientific community does not. But the Goswami gave them their come down the sawdust trail and repent invitation as scientists in that book. 
Einstein went on to say that regardless of who we are or what our role in the universe might be, we're all subject to a greater power. Here's the way he said it, Einstein said. Human beings, vegetables, or cosmic dust, we all dance to a mysterious tune intoned in the distances by an invisible piper. We dance, he says. Einstein. Now, again, let me be clear. I don't want to be mislead you. When Einstein used the word God, he did not use, mean the word the way you and I do. There are atheists, and the prefix a negates. It means not. The, word, the letter a in front of the word atheist means not theist. A theist believes in a God, in God. Atheist says no God. Uh, agnostic, gnosis, knowledge, agnostic, no knowing whether or not there's a God. But among those who would speak of God, you have those who are theists, T-H-E-I-S-T-S, -E and those who are deists, D-E-I-S-T-S. -E you and I are theists. A theist believes in God as being a person with sentience, with uh, self-awareness, with personhood, with will, you know, with volition and emotion. We believe that the word God points to a person, a, a, one with personhood. And that would be true whether you, your God is, is, is uh, uh, the God of the Muslim or whether your God is the God of the Christian now, let me be, make sure you know, Buddhism is not really a religion. Buddha was not their god. Buddhism is a philosophy. So theists believe in a god who is a person. Deism sees the, the divine as an energy, as an energy, impersonal energy that fills the cosmos. Einstein was a deist. A lot of people in this country, in the U.S., uh, love to talk about how this nation was founded by Christian people, but I hate to crack it to you, but a lot of them weren't. The fact that they wanted separation of church and state, uh, that's, a, that's a value that we in the U.S. treasure, and I think in North America we all do, but a lot of those early founding fathers in this country were deist. Thomas Jefferson was a deist, not a theist. So they weren't Christians. They weren't even theists, but they were deists. A lot of quantum people like uh, Amit Goswami is a deist, not a theist. But, you know, here's my thinking on this. Remember what I talked about, how there's a wide road in, or in another time before we, the video? I said there's a wide road that leads to the more narrow point. Well, I'm glad to see, listen, if there's a scientist out there that has the kind of revered credentials and reputation that a man like Amit Goswami has, I understand he's not a Christian, but I'm glad to see somebody in that world at least nudging scientists away from atheism, right? There's a progression of understanding we all have, and I'm glad to see them come to that place where these new scientists are saying, no, it would be naive and foolish for you to claim atheism these days because as Max Planck said we must assume that there is a conscious and intelligent mind behind uh, what we see and as Einstein Einstein fought and debated with quantum physicists in his day early on he debated it he pushed back against it but to his credit he reached a place where he finally could not deny its reality and he embraced it and began to contribute to it. So let me kind of try to close this introductory session by saying that this invisible world, as I've said to summarize, is a world of divine energy, pure energy, pervasive energy, and that energy is what theologian Paul Tillich called the, our ground of being. It is the essence of reality. It is what Planck called the matrix, what modern writers have called the field, the unified field, the metro, metamorphic field, uh, the universe, source, God. 
what Jesus called the kingdom of God, what Paul called in Christ. Quantum physics attempts to look into that from a scientific standpoint and to study how, what, and why everything that makes up that universe, both seen and unseen, is derived. Unlike traditional physics, that for the most part looks at everything in life as physical, a physical machine of sorts, quantum physics has discovered and asserts that it's all energy. It's all light, as some physicists refer to it. Did you hear me? I hadn't said that yet. Quantum physicists say ultimate reality is light. You get it? Mm -hmm. The world is not what we believed. I told my group one day about the first time I ever meditated. I was 28, and I was suicidal. I seriously contemplated committing suicide at 28 years old. I was in a horrific situation where I found myself in life in the ministry context. I was miserable. Financially, I was struggling to survive. I had three different jobs and going to school on top of that. I had four young children, all just about babies, and a million-dollar life insurance policy that had been paid in for long enough that I checked. It would have paid. And at the point where I actually one day had taken a bottle of pills from a relative who had been addicted to prescription pills, extended family, poured them on my desk, stared at them and thought I could end it right here, right now. I don't remember what my thinking was that made me not do it. But I do remember sometime after that saying, I've got to find some answers. And I'd read some things about meditation, and I put some headphones on my head, and I put in a cassette tape of contemplative meditation music, not, quote, Christian music, just, I think it was actually gongs. And I began to listen and just be silent and just become aware of my place in the universe. And I said, as I have many, many times since then, I still do often. But this was the first time I'd done it. I'm open. I'm open. And a thought suddenly came into my mind that was so clear and so loud that I knew it didn't come from me because, first of all, it made no sense. And second, I know my own voice, <laughs> and it didn't sound like me. And at a time when I was looking at life and it seemed so confusing and chaotic and helpless and hopeless to the point that I thought of ending my life, that voice said to me, things are not as they appear. That's all. Scared the crap out of me. I'm hearing voices in my head. I ripped the headphones off, threw them on my desk, and I said, because all the, the only tools I had for interpreting something like that were religious tools. So I said, being a good 28-year-old evangelical, Baptist to boot, I said, that was demonic. And took a lot of years before I would open my mind up to contemplative meditation. And it was a friend named Barry Greco, Toshi, you know him, who introduced me to that again. But I've thought many times, now science is saying what that voice said to me at 28 years old. 
things are not as they appear. And I've wondered many times if I would not ripped the headphones off my head and allowed religion, as it often does, to become a referee that threw me out of the game for a time. I wonder what that voice would have continued to tell me had I listened. I don't know what you're dealing with in life right now. You may be on top of your game or you may be at the bottom of the heap. But I'm telling you what, everything you can see and experience in this world right now in a physical dimension, it's not what it appears. There's a bigger world. There's a transcendent world. There's a world of pure energy, of divine love, of Christ consciousness. There's an ether, an atmosphere, an ocean that we live in that defines what life really is. If we just have eyes to see it. The world is not what we've thought, and your life may not be what you've thought. You may feel stuck. You may feel limited. You may feel trapped. You may feel confined. But you and the world are more than you had believed. At our most elemental stage or existence we are not just a chemical reaction we're an electrical charge everything in this that energy is vibrating I'll say more about this in another session everything is in vibration everything is a frequency everything is in movement everything is music everything is a dance And your very existence, sitting right in that chair in this room, is nothing less than a coalescence of divine energy from a realm that you cannot see, a reality, a field called spirit that is manifesting through you in human form right now. And that pulsating source, that energy, that divine love is the very matrix, the very DNA of your being and your consciousness. This quantum life that I'm talking about has personhood who is called Alpha and Omega. And it's inside that world that we all live and move and exist. Now I've given you an introduction this morning about the a hidden world that is emerging but I can't wait to get back tonight <laughs> because tonight and tomorrow morning and evening and then Saturday morning I'm going to tell you how we live in this new reality and I'm going to give you specific exact things to do to enable you to ex live and experience what this hidden world thus hidden until now what this hidden world that you can't see with your eyes has to offer and I'm telling you my wife is sitting in this room and she will tell you this has rocked my world it has changed my life and I can't wait to share the, the, uh, the three things I'm going to talk to you about four things that I'm going to talk to you about that will change your world. Some of it won't be brand new to some of you because interestingly enough, some of you have heard it in the world of religion. But sadly enough, in the places that have offered it where I've been exposed to it, they said, come on in, the water's fine, but I couldn't help but note they always peed in the pool. And even though the core of what some of them were saying in their religious world, even though the core of it was absolutely right, I just couldn't jump in and swim with them. Yeah. I just, their religion, that it was so religion. 
so religious. I couldn't jump in there and swim with them. <laughs> I know. You're going further than I did. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. So what time are we starting? What did we say? 7 o'clock. So please let's start on time tonight. Let's plan to start on time, and uh, we'll come back. And tonight, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, th 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 this morning, the, the title of the uh, talk this morning was, uh, a, what was it, a hidden, a hidden world is being revealed. The hidden world is being revealed. T tonight, in the second session, uh, we're awakening the quantum life, and the title for tonight is, in our quantum life, we see differently. And what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is moving from potentiality into actuality. And I'm going to share with you, as I said, an experiment that scientists, ever since the first time it was done, carried out, and it's been carried out a gazillion times. There's not a physics uni a university in the world that does, has a physics department that, that hasn't done this experiment. And every time it's been done, it works the same way. And it is an experiment that scientists say broke reality because it was so different from what they expected. It, they said it's the experiment that broke reality. In fact, some of them got so mad about it, fundamentalist scientists said, I wish I'd never heard about it because I can't deny it. One of them even went so far as to say, if that experiment's true, it's the end of science. And what he really meant was, it's the end of my kind of science. And, had, and as we say in Georgia, you got that right. <laughs> it was the end of that kind of materialistic science that he had embraced. So anyway, I'm, I'm jacked up about it. <laughs> All right.